Good morning. I'm Professor Ian Hickey, the Co-Director of Health and Policy at the Brain and Mind Centre of the University of Sydney. Welcome to this special webinar organised by the Committee for Sydney on protecting your mental health or protecting our mental health, our collective mental health, during this very difficult time of the pandemic. I'm joined this morning by three really important people. Maha Abdo, from Mus the CEO of Muslim Women's Australia. Sam Moyston, company director, AFL legend, AFL women's legend, and director herself, but also strong supporter of the arts and community groups. And Georgie Harmon, the CEO of Beyond Blue, a national anxiety and depression initiative. This particular webinar talks about us, the collective response. I think one of the really interesting and challenging issues in Australia, but particularly in Sydney at the moment, is can we collectively respond in the best possible way to the social and health crisis that we now face? There have been many difficult issues raised by the necessity of socially disconnecting, physically distancing, and withdrawing from many of our traditional social roles in our communities, in our churches, in our sporting groups, in our workplaces. And we have many different communities trying to respond in appropriate ways. Like many crises, there's both an opportunity here, but also a threat. If handled well, this places real pressure, real tension on our social fabric and may result in the kind of blaming and shaming and accusations that we've seen at times between East and Western Sydney, between different communities within our particular wider metropolis. On the other hand, there's a real opportunity here that if we can act collectively, we can respond in appropriate ways for the short term, but also for the longer term, that we may end up with a more inclusive society that is in the interest of all of our mental health and well-being, our collective mental health and well-being, a term that we've preferred to call the mental wealth of Australia, but particularly in a complex city like Sydney, how are we going to respond? I'll ask each of our guests to comment shortly. Each is, brings a particular perspective. Maha, living and working with some of the particularly affected communities in southwestern Sydney. Sam, through her work with community groups, but also with the corporate sector, and also with trying to improve basically the social fabric of the city in which we live. And Georgie Harmon, not only through her experiences uh, leading our National Depression Initiative, Beyond Blue, but also what happened in, with direct experiences of what happened in Melbourne last year during a similar set of phases. We will come to answering questions and addressing the particular issues. I would say the emphasis is on our collective mental health. A lot of the mental health commentary, and I'm part of this, is about how you as an individual might cope, or as we classically said in Australia, are you okay? And we'll be saying that again next month in September with Are You OK Day. What we want to say at this point is, are we okay? collectively, in our families, in our social groups, in our workplaces, in the places in which we really cherish that are essential to our collective well-being. So the emphasis of this particular webinar will be a little bit different perhaps than some which have said what you might do to stay sane and well and cope as an individual, but much more how do we do that in our communities with the ongoing challenges. And as we all know now at this point, this is ongoing and challenging for us all. So I might ask for some opening comments, and particularly uh, to start with Maha, from what is the experience in southwestern Sydney at the moment? Maha. Thank you. Um, I think this is, um, you know, today, as I was saying, it, it just feels um, very heavy. Um, hearing of the loss of, um, you know, lives and the young woman that passed away yesterday. So there's a lot of and, and passed away at home. Um, so um, at a fault of, you know, no fault of her own. So there's a sense of anxiety heightened and there's a sense of fear, but at the same time, really there is hope. There is hope because the conversations around the place is that we can get over this, we can do this together. The more we say we can do this together, but the leadership that keeps on coming out and the, and the conversations and the messages that have been coming out is about shaming the community. And that is very, very much causing that sense of um, whatever we do is not good enough. And, and that, you know, young people are feeling blamed for someone else's, um, you know, mistakes where, you know, in Sydney, it started in Bondi and now Western Sydney and Southwestern Sydney are having to feel the burden and, and, and take on the responsibility of, of saving the, you know, this whole, you know, um, Sydney from 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 the from COVID. So I think that the issue right now is very much about we want to work together, 
but and that's what everyone's continuously saying but at the same time it's not a divide this is not about dividing and conquering this is about working together and how do we work together we need to listen listen with our hearts and listen to to learn not listen to to just respond and blame and shame a whole of community so i love your expression maha to name the problem we need to name it in the sense that yes. the problem at the moment is most acute in south and western sydney and has affected the most families there and tragically we have seen deaths at home of quite young people with many responsibilities, but not to blame and shame, not name in order to blame and shame, but name in order to change. Yeah. And I suppose act collectively. So I wonder if I could ask Sam about acting collectively, because a lot of your work, Sam, in so many sectors, in the non-government sector, in the arts, in the sports, and also in business is about collective action. How do you see things evolving at the moment? Thanks, Ian. It's just a real privilege to be to be alongside um, all of you on this on this panel. And, and I'm learning every every time I listen to the other panelists, I learn something more about what it means to be part of a collective. Um, I'm also joining from Gadigal land here in your nation in Sydney, and and pay my respects to to the, the elders, past, present, and emerging around all of our indigenous communities. And, and think about, I guess, we also should take into account as Maha has said about how we think about community and also think about those communities in Western New South Wales and around Shepparton and where Indigenous communities who talk and teach us about collective action um, are under such strain at the moment with, with their outbreaks. Um, to, to your question, Ian, I think um, it, we've got to lift into that collective mindset. I think you've taught us all, and you've certainly taught me, that we have to move from the how am I, how are you, to the how are we. And when we apply that across our communities, I guess where, what I see in the corporate sector, particularly at the moment, is um, the best of corporate leaders are understanding that and are beginning to talk that language. Um, there is a um, particular uh, feature, I think, of great leadership at the moment. I've seen it with, say, Sue Lloyd Hurwitz at Mervac or, or, or Kim McKay as Chief Executive of the Australian Museum of getting messages from the very top of those organisations to all of their employees to actually check in and say, how are we all going? And how are you managing your teams and your staff and, and giving permission for people to not actually be perfect right now and, and setting new bar uh, time um, um, limits and on Zoom meetings and actually asking people to think about their own communities. So I think there's been a, a shift um, in, the, in the corporate world to changing the messaging around this and a lot of desire for big companies to think about their relationship with community and trying to find those those ways of, of making contact. Um, and I think there's gonna be a lot of humility involved in that in, in the corporate world. And I hope that in our big systems work, whether it's health, treasury, you know, the places where big decisions are being made about um, how, we, how we take care of people, that those people who run big systems actually spend time talking and listening, as Maha has said, to the real lived experience in a place-based way um, and don't make the mistake of introducing policies and using language that in and of itself separates us, which I think has been one of the problems that and Maha is living that. Um, so our sense of community within a broader set of wherever we find ourselves, I think is gonna to have to be at the forefront of our planning. Uh, you know, I, you've talked about this a lot. We cannot come out of this with the systems we went in with. Um, and these kind of issues are now with us and will be pervasive. And for Sydney, we've got to find a way to talk about that collective interest um, at all levels, if we're to make sure this city can come through this and prepare for the, the rolling set of challenges that come, but also approach that with a very strong sense of optimism um, and hope and, and generosity and, and, and really talk about the spirit of us as communities. Um, and I think that's gonna be a, a lot more connecting with what happens on the ground, Ian. And, um, and I think good leaders are seeing that. I do think there is a gap though between those that are at the very top of our systems and talking to us or at us, um, and those that have got the lived experience and those that are sitting at home every day hoping that things will get better but needing to see signs of it. Last thing I'd say is there are some very big structural things going on in addition to the, the comments that Maha made and one that goes to the position of women in our society more generally. And we are seeing now um, the terrible pressure, predominantly on women, not exclusively, but on women who are at home, working from home, caring for their families and communities, homeschooling, taking care of kids going through HSC and holding things together. And increasingly we're seeing a lot of those women removing themselves from the paid workforce. And that's why you see a, um, a drop in the people looking for work at the moment. We can't afford systemically or collectively or from a community point of view to let these wonderful women fall out of our respected paid workforces 
to take that burden and be back in any form of poverty or um, or isolation, just you know, dealing with the pervasive need for care. I might stop there, Ian. And... Maybe Georgie. I, I'm always interested, Georgie, in your, I mean, you see this from an incredible series, and you're not in Sydney, you're in Melbourne, of course, um, running Beyond Blue. So what do, you, what, what do you think about the collective notion of mental health? Oh, look, I, I think, so, so can I just start by acknowledging that I'm on beautiful Wurundjeri country and pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, and it's lovely to, to join two fabulous women and, and obviously Ian as well, who I think we've lost for a moment now. Um, so look, I, I come at this from two perspectives. First, um, I, I've, I've always had a struggle with this idea of resilience, right? Because you cannot as an individual be resilient if you don't have work or if your work is insecure, if you're facing health anxiety or sickness, if you live in poverty, um, and if you don't have community around you. So, so what this last, this last 18 months has absolutely punctuated and, and it, we can't unsee it, is the structural and um, the structural faults in some of our systems or some of our policies. And the fact that there are two levels of superpower at the moment, at an individual level, our individual superpower is self-care. Self-care is a very uncomfortable feeling for many of us because it means in that moment you actually put yourself ahead of others. But, you know, that old adage of you have to put your own oxygen mask on to be there for community is, is I think, really, really important. And then at a collective level, our, our collective superpower is community. And we and, and that sounds glib, but, it, but, you know, at every single level, um, through my experience, both at work and, and, and living through the pandemic, community is the thing that's going to get us through this. Um, science and politics don't, don't mix. We've seen that when polit politicians start bickering at each other and finger pointing, the mental load that that adds to people is immense. We see that almost immediately in, in the sentiment and the, and the comments in our services. Um, we need to stop making assumptions about what people need um, and actually let that come up from the ground and listen to community leaders who really are in touch with people. Um, the policy responses can't be homogenous. Um, and I think I think as a as a country, we're we're leaning in more and more to, and we're more engaged with the quality of our politics, the quality of our political leaders, the quality of decisions and the way that governments are administered. And I think, um, you know, we, we can't let go of that. We have to actually hold our leaders to account now. Um, but look, I mean, I can talk endlessly about what we're experiencing in our services, but I think, you know, again, um, it, it comes down to community and it comes down to remembering that anybody can get COVID, but the impacts and after effects of COVID actually are extremely discriminatory and they discriminate against people, again, who have casualised or insecure work, um, who come from different socioeconomic backgrounds, who live in poverty, who live with disability, who live with mental health challenges. Um, yeah, so, so those are my sort of reflections. At, but again, I think it's really important that we offer hope to people because, um, you know, we're going through the middle of a storm at the moment. We need to pack an, an umbrella, but, but every single storm passes. Um, and, you know, I, I think if we can come out of this having learned some really, really hard lessons, um, and actually applying them to our daily lives, as well as holding others to account, we're all going to do better. So, Georgie, and I'm sorry, they're dropping out for a moment. The internet uh, system, as we know in Australia, doesn't always support us in the way we might like. But just Melbourne went through some very interesting experiences last year, very difficult discussions about particular things. And of course, early in some of the uh, quarantine kind of breakdowns, various communities, there was, a, there was a degree of sort of, I think, similar kind of potential for blaming but came together in a different kind of way. But what, what do you think Sydney might learn out of what actually happened in terms of some of the Melbourne responses? And, and what do you make of the differences right now in the way that the problems are being addressed? Oh, look, I think it's really unhelpful for Victorians to comment on what's happening in New South Wales. <laughs> I'm not going to add to okay. that. But just just um, what was but, learned. But, just but what think, was learned. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What was, what was learned? I think, I think we, we learned that... Again, the nuancing of policy is really important. It is highly contextualised and individualised people's experience of living through lockdowns and living through health anxiety and trauma. Um, things like the single bubble. So I live alone. 
The biggest issue for me is loneliness, even though I've got amazing friends, a family who's safe, you know, they're all overseas. But the thing for me was loneliness. And to, to go in those initial months when I literally, the only people I saw were people that I bumped into in the street or my local coffee coffee shop, you know, barista. Um, so, so having that single bubble was really, really important. And we took a while to get there. And I know that that's something that's now been adopted in, in New South Wales. Um, things like payments to stay at home for people who um, needed to get tested, who'd been potentially exposed to the virus um, and, and who really feared not going into work because they might lose their hours or, you know. Um, so payments for all types of workers, including casual workers, to stay at home, to go and get tested and then to isolate at home. Um, that really, really made a difference to people um, and I think continues to make a difference to people. Um, things like the, the, the shocking... The shocking situation where we locked down um, three public housing towers. I mean, that was that was visceral. That was just awful. Um, and I think we've learned a lot about, you know, how you can't talk about we're all in this together and treat different groups differently. Um, well, I think that was a really interesting one, Georgie, that the imagery of police rushing to those towers and immediately, although we all understand the public health nature of it for immediacy, of a law and order and sort of compliance-based approach, yeah. rather than necessarily talking about some of the most vulnerable people in the state in particular types of ways. And we've seen this with sort of locking off for certain apartment blocks in Sydney now and a very just being locked off. So this strong emphasis on legalism and compliance, command and control type of approaches. I just wonder, Maha, if you'd like to comment how that actually looks, if that happens in your street or to your community, and we've seen this in New South Wales again with the deployment of the Australian Defence Forces with all the best intentions. But how does it look? How does it feel when that happens in your street, in your community? Yeah. I mean, when we're trying to, you know, the fact that we get um, literally, um, uh, you know, scolded by the police every morning, um, you know, telling us that we're not doing enough and we, don't, we need to do this and this and this. And then you see police cars going up and down in your streets, literally, um, you know, the, 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 the ang it's not just the anxiety, it's the fear. Mothers are, and I was, we were listening to a group of mothers yesterday, only last night, one mother was saying to me, I fear my 18 year old son going out because of this curfew and being pulled up by police because we've had police knock on our doors because my son went out to um, exercise with a friend of his who lives just down the road from him. So there's harshness in that way. It's become like <clears throat> policing a community where you're actually, what we should be doing is promoting and providing hope and health um, advice and support rather than, um, you know, um, increasing that, that fear in people that it, well, what if I do this and what if I do this? So there's that, and children at the moment are are, are being, um, you know, living in a in a situation where they're fearing if they see a, a police person or or any. So this is, um, I mean, in a in a in a in a world where we want to create hope and we want to create, um, you know, um, certainty. It certainly is not being done right here in New South Wales at the moment, because no matter how much we talk about the effect that the police is having, there's all these re-traumatised um, emotions that are coming through where people fear police. And for the last 20 years or 25 years, we've been working so closely with police, promoting police engagement, promoting the effect of police in a positive way, where I feel all of a sudden, has just sort of somehow gone out the window and now we see policing and even checking on people who've been isolating because of COVID, um, doing a roll call and then creating that sort of, um, you know, feeling of, you know, um, that you've done something wrong because you have this COVID um, and you have health issues with elderly people, you have young people, young children who are asleep who get knocked on the door at, at four o'clock in the morning to wake them up and check if that if you're all at home. So it's a combination of so much fear that is breeding in people's heart that um, is, is causing not just anxiety, but causing um uh, you know, um, uncertainty in the uncertainty right now, where 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 um, a community has been literally 
labeled, like I said earlier, and, and made feel guilty. So there's not, not just that guilt trip, but it's, we want to create a space of, you know, um, promoting health and well-being and, and then, you know, inject hope in people's hearts. But the, the, the bottom line is police are breeding fear. Well, I'd like to see a police person with a nurse or someone else, you know, combined efforts going knocking on people's door with kind heart, actually saying, how are you? We're looking after your well-being. There's no need to create that, uh, that, that fear where we, if we're really keen and we're really sincere about police, you know, making sure that people are complying, but it's those that need, um, you know, need a lot of support in, the, in, in health, mental health, health and well-being, physical health and mental health is, is really of the utmost at, the, at, the, at, at this moment of time. So we can combine both and, 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 a, and a community <clears throat> uh, response as well, where you can have a collaborative approach that really will create a lot more hope and effect in a way that's what we're all calling for. Uh, in, I suppose in, that's a key. That's a key issue, actually. What's actually effective to achieve the outcome? I, I did find it staggering myself. The change, and this is coming from an issue from the top, saying that we would no longer have an emphasis on community policing during this. We would go to compliance-based approach. And I thought, now that comes from the top. Going back to George's comment about hope, if someone's asked in particular, you know, to what extent is hope nurtured by politicians, by other community leaders, actually acting in a way of saying how we can act? Mistakes get made. There are a lot of challenges at the moment. No one simply has the answer here in Australia or anyone else to many of the challenges that we face. This sort of actually hope through productive action, I think the point you made, George, about actually listening what's going on. Sam, I know you've got comments about this, about you know how the committee might actually come about do this. And the leadership roles, as you're often in one of these leadership roles on behalf of organisations, of the listening and working together rather than simply directing. Yeah. I mean, I think this is the heart of this whole conversation and Maha has just given it its heart and soul and the experience that she has and watching that community and that death of that young woman um, yesterday, I think should be the, the moment we say that we've, we have not learnt what all of these things are then doing and the impact it has on, on that family, those children, her husband and the community around her and the fear that that is, that is now creating the anxiety. I thought I'd just um, riff a bit off Maha to say, um, Big systems and big organisations often find it very hard to find their pathways to knowing what is happening and to change and to adjust and say we got that wrong. And um, I, you know, I'm lucky. I live in the inner west of Sydney, and so within my allowable activity at the moment is to go to Addison Road Community Centre to work on the the packing of boxes that go out largely to Western Sydney and South Western Sydney. What I've learned standing on that production line of boxes is that one, we had to go and fundraise to find money for halal boxes and for culturally appropriate boxes. So these food boxes weren't just turning up um, and not being respected and, and we we're not showing respect and love for the community. That's the first thing. Second thing though, along that production line were the local area command community policing officers who were telling a different story about what they needed from the connection to a community centre. So as they were doing their policing and their engagement, they turned up with the health and well-being and food supplies for those communities and they were trying to work out locally how could they do that because there's no there was no systemic response that they were working against a system that says we're now policing for compliance but the good people who've been um, part of those communities often from those cultures you know, within those communities in the policing system actually come out with the best the best ideas and then you have overstrained community centers trying to do the work of government by saying, well, we'll give you the boxes, we'll help you. And in that moment, there is a, there's a lesson for the big systemic drivers and the people who drive policy, because at that moment, the community centre was also receiving calls from people in those areas, either where English wasn't a first language and the, message, the urgent health messages were coming in only one language and on texts and were very extreme, they didn't know what it said. And secondly, saying, um, if you're in this LGA, and a lot of people, I don't know most days which LGA I'm in, I'm in a suburb, I'm in a community, I'm in a street. And for the communities that this messaging was going to be told, if you're in this LGA, this is now your life. How on earth can those community members comply when they've never thought about an LGA? I mean, we don't talk about that in our communities. We talk about, as Maha said, our suburbs and our streets and our communities. So something has gone wrong. 
So I guess my offer up is I've seen something different happen in a corporate sense. So I'll use the Melbourne Sydney piece that, that um, Georgie, I think you have every right to tell us about Melbourne. <laughs> and I saw <laughs> I saw um, the chief executive of Mervac. So we're a national company. I'm on the board there. And Susan um, was getting ready for how the Sydney residents of, and the, member, the employees of Mervac would be dealing with the next lockdown. And she just did a very simple thing. She got on a call with the people in Melbourne who were prepared to share from senior to, to junior to share what it was like to go into lockdown six after five other lockdowns and how they really felt. And she asked them to be totally honest. And it was a highly emotional session. And the people in Melbourne said, we, it was this resilience piece. We, that stopped telling us to be resilient, stopped telling us we're all in it together. As a leader and as the company, we've got to actually understand we are all in some form of crisis and anxiety. We need compassion, we need care. And listening to that informed how Susan then could talk to the whole company and the Sydney siders to say, we're learning from what's happened in Melbourne about what we're not going to do wrong when we support you. So we're going to be much more directive. We're going to be much more onto this early with you. And I just watched Susan do that as a leader, connecting with the reality of what was going on rather than staying at the platitudes and staying at the, we're in it together, you know, take good care of yourselves, we'll get through this. And so what happened, I think, with the communication, I hope that's what's happening with, the, with large employers where, where leaders are actually giving permission right across their, their employee bases and saying, we're learning and something's got wrong in the first lockdown. And I hope those leaders then go to government and go to people who are big decision makers and really advocate hard for that what, what responds to the lived experience of our communities, because they can do that. Those conversations are taking place all the time, but they need to reflect the learnings and the failings. And if we could learn from each other's states, you know, and, not, and put aside this ridiculous Sydney-Melbourne divide, and this east-west divide in Sydney, that's that's got to be part of a, a, a solution for all of our, our community well-being. Can I just so add? Just encourage, just one, one second, Joe. Just encourage people to use the Q and A function. There are questions and answers coming in, and we'll start to attend to them shortly. But Georgie, so use the Q and A function. But Georgie, you had a comment. Can Can I just add something to the leadership piece? Because um, I think uh, your question, Ian, was what can, or I think there was something in the chat about what can leaders actually do. We can get off our platforms and soapboxes and actually give them to other people. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that I found fascinating and frustrating um, and, you know, really caused me rage at times is, is the lack of good communication, clear communication, consistent communication, including when you don't know what the answer is. Because as leaders, we can't fix the unfixable. But what we can actually do is we can share our platforms with other people, including our own staff, including, you know, local community leaders. Um, and actually uh, engage and communicate very differently to how we would normally. Um, I also think, uh, you know, honest, clear, regular communication is actually an antidote to fear, um, including by saying, actually, I don't know what the solution is here, but perhaps you've got some ideas that you want to share with me. And, I, and that's something that I've tried to practice in my own leadership at, at Beyond Blue. And, and the other thing I found is it's not the big grand gestures that actually make the most difference often. It's the hundred small things. And it's you getting out the way and actually letting your team, for example, in a workplace context, actually come up with the solutions that are going to have the most meaning to them. So, Georgie, I think you raised a really interesting point, which I think is very obvious to many of us who work in these areas. There are no simple answers. The situation is rapidly changing. So there are not simple political decisions either. In, in particular ways and the transparency or honesty about the situation. If you see Dr. Fauci in America this morning, he's saying he's not sure what's going to happen next in terms of further strains, what might happen through the North American uh, winter period, et cetera, for the ramifications for all this. I think if Dr. Fauci is not very certain about what happens next, I think the rest of us are pretty uncertain too. The issue is, do we actually have the structures politically, socially to continue to respond to these ongoing challenges? So I think the leadership question Somebody else has asked in the Q&A, if, if leadership is used to be divisive, and I think we've seen and we should learn worldwide the way in which the crisis has been misused in various, various countries to create further divisions, how masks ever became a political issue in the United States, how various other communities have been included or excluded, the learning from others as we go. This issue about now collectively, the extent to which people are included in the decision making, or we have what we appear to have at the moment, is a national cabinet which is struggling with that, actually relating to the various communities. And probably in Australia, we're a very wide set of different communities. Here we're emphasising, in fact, Sydney is very different from other parts of regional New South Wales. Within Sydney, there are different communities. So I think we need to comment further about, you know, 
how we influence those particular sort of structures. There's those who are in leadership roles, but there's actually how the community actually expresses itself. I wonder if you'd like to comment as well, Maha, about how the community actually, its voice could be amplified within a lot of these discussions, then reflected back, I think, in the daily briefings, in the media briefings, in the faces we see, in the voices we hear, in that actually that the common sense, I, I made a mistake at the start of this in failing to recognise the Indigenous people of this country, and I'm on the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, but in a lot of my discussions with Jackie Troy and many other Indigenous leaders, a marvellous expression they have is how the mob is doing. Now, in the, to Anglo-Saxons, the idea of mob law sounds like a terrible, chaotic, anarchic thing, as a thing from a collective set of decisions to act all in a particular way. How do we amplify that particular voice sure. of the community? Maha, do you have a view? Yeah, look, I, I think it's it's important to realise that we don't have to wait for an epide- a, a pandemic or an epidemic or anything to, to, to really do. We, you know, collectively work on something because... In, the, in a time of a normal life, we've always worked together. We've always been, you know, we get consulted on certain things and, and there needs to be a lot more done. But um, I, I think the, 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 the most important thing is that we've, as, as everyone has been saying around here, is that um, we need to be able to own up and say, um, you know, that um, no matter who we are and where we're at, we don't know everything. There are certain people, there are community leaders who know, but they need to consult with their communities as well. So it is about us, all of this. And when we hear that we're all in this together and we together, we're going to be stronger. And you know, we're not all in this together. There's this divisive um, messaging that keeps on going. Well, it takes its toll on the leadership in different communities, whether it's in our Indigenous communities or whether it's in our, you know, community, you know, non-English speaking communities. And right now we're all in this Southwestern Sydney community that we are so diverse and then we have our differences. But when, it, when something like this, we need to come together and we don't need um, more division. So the way we can come together, I think it's, we've done it in the past, we do it when there's you know, where there's floods, where there's fires and where there's all these um, natural um, disasters, we all come together. What brings us together is that need and that sense of bringing kindness to others so that we want to be, it's not we want to be kind, that's part of us. And it's about that collective thing that doesn't get recognised in mainstream community or leadership. You know, the leadership will continuously talk about what, is relevant to them. And I don't mean one particular leadership. And I think when we really feel wholeheartedly, we are talking about collective, um, you know, responsibility, there's collective accountability that comes with that. So how do we work with that? We need to, like, as I said earlier, and I'll continuously to say, we need to really create an avalanche of kindness and avalanche of peace, but it's not something that is theoretical, you know, it's got to be practical. And this is the way today. And I see it right now as I have, I, I am heavy and I can and I'm, I have a heavy heart today because of loss. But when I sit here and I'm having that engagement and looking at ways of we can work together, I think we're already starting that we're already injecting that bit of a, a you know, that, that drop, in the ocean of uncertainty right now, the storm that, you know, Georgie talked about and Sam. So there is light at the end of the tunnel, but we need to hang on. We need to share the light. We can't just hope for others to, um, to find it for themselves. We need to be real. We need to be authentic. And, it's, and we need to be vulnerable. And it's okay for our leaders to show vulnerability and say, you know, it's hard. I cried last night, you know. That is when you touch people's hearts. That's what I feel is collective leadership and collective responsibility. Sorry. No, it's so, so good for you to raise I just take the avalanche of kindness. You know, George talked about hope, and I think it is these kind actions. It is an interesting issue about, uh, I certainly think in, in Australia's history about great leaders that we've had who have been well cherished you know bob hawk in tears was always much more effective than bob hawk yelling at people or screaming at people at union meetings you know kind of ideas about actually strong empathy for the situations that arose whether that was in his own personal life in response to the chinese to kind of issues that we've had you know that expression of leaders having empathy and i think this issue about community leadership being evident 
in the news briefings, in the, in the decision making. I'd like to ask you, George, a really important question, I think, and one I've thought about a lot during this period, whether mental health has been put aside in relation to health and only physical health, only infection, only control of the virus is the only real health that matters. And we'll put our whole national health capacity, private and public, to ventilators, to ICU, to the public health response, but mental health can kind of wait. Although, as many of us in the world described it, it is the kind of shadow pandemic that's actually running. In terms of running one of our national mental health agencies, do you have that sense of, you know, yes, we're being talked about, but no, we're not really kind of the same? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I mean, look, there's been lots of money thrown at mental health, and that is a good thing in the last um, 18 months. Um, uh, and some of those investments, I think, have been really good. Um, but I think what we, and, and I think the other side of that is that uh, as a community, um, we are having a much deeper and more profound conversation about mental health and well-being because everybody's mental health and well-being has been affected in some way. So I think, you know, there, there, there's been more progress made in terms of, you know, really that more open and honest conversation about, um, you know, the fact that depression, anxiety, psychosis, you know, they don't discriminate. Um, they can affect any one of us. So, so there's been lots of money thrown at mental health. There's, um, there's big budget packages that are um, clashing around. But to me, it's the structural stuff that we're still not um, leaning into. And um, we can throw lots of money at uh, existing services and new, and new services, but unless we actually get governments planning and investing that, uh, pl planning investments together, um, and actually looking at the things that are really going to make the difference around uh, workforce capacity, um, diversity of workforce, new types of workforce, um, uh, breaking down the issues of affordability for people um, and access, um, and really kind of stop, again, stop the kind of um, uh, jurisdictionally versus Commonwealth-based sort of arguments and argy-bargy that goes on around, well, you know, we've we've invested three million, three billion and you've only invested a billion, you know. It's actually about joining up that investment and actually planning for the long term about what we think it really matters. Investing more in prevention and early intervention as well as at the at the acute end. Uh, we've got a, a a national agreement that's apparently being negotiated between governments at the moment that's supposed to um to uh, pop out the other end in November. Um, and that follows yet another cycle of national and re and state-based reviews of the mental health system, which pretty much have said the same thing for the last two decades. Um, and I, my fear is that, um, that the, the pandemic is going to overshadow the shadow, as you say, um, Ian, and that we're gonna, we're gonna have invested again so much as communities and as a sector in trying to get governments to address this structural reform issue. Um, and it's just going to get too hard or it's going to, you know, they're going to say, oh, we don't have enough money or whatever. But, you know, we've got to invest to save. And we know that, you know, the, one of the best investments we can actually make right now is in, in people's well-being. So so I, I, I actually am, I'm usually a very pos positive and, and optimistic person, but I'm starting to feel a little bit pessimistic about mental health reform, I must admit. So that's the really interesting thing, because I think coming back to my opening comments about crisis, a crisis can be something that actually drives structural reform. And we saw it to some degree in mental health, for example, and in health, the rapid use of telehealth. Like yeah. As Minister Hunt said, more was done in 10 days than the previous 10 years, which was a reflection on what we didn't really do for the previous 10 years because the technology has been there for a long time. There are many structural kind of elements that are there. Another one that's particularly relevant to this discussion is the promotion of more regionally sensitive approaches in Australia. Our states and territories probably don't reflect that well the communities we actually live the dysfunction between the Commonwealth and the states. I wonder if you have comments, Sam, about the opportunity for structural change, yeah. not just in mental. I think there are other really important issues out there at the moment, childcare, support for women who've been affected, support for young people in particular industries that are really important to our collective wellbeing and participation, which are central, in fact, to mental health, that are really in focus now as a consequence of the crisis. But um, since Georgie and I might be on the slightly pessimistic side for structural change, are you on the more optimistic I'm, side and the broader issues? I'm going to go big on this one. And I'm going to say today's webinar is brought to you courtesy of the letter C. So we've got the C's for me. We've had, um, we're talking about community. We've talking about COVID. We're leaning into climate change. 
we have a communications crisis and we don't talk enough about care. So I, where I end up with the positive is I think we could restructure our economy really productively and vibrantly if we thought about our economy being all about care. And I don't mean soft care. I don't mean suddenly getting all, um, um, not all caring about the economy and having the hard conversations. But for me, there's care provides a hierarchy for how you could actually assess whether our economy and our society is doing well. And I'll come to that in just one sec. If I go back to the other Cs, everything we're learning in COVID is a foretaste for what's happening with climate change and climate crisis. So whatever we're experiencing now at our mental health level and our physical health level is just a taste of what happens as we get a warming planet and we have bigger migration rates, catastrophes and lose, losing our environment, all those kinds of things. And whilst that's scary, the response is actually that we have to prepare ourselves and use what we're learning through COVID to get ready for those, those next big complex challenges. And what we're doing, what we've done really badly with COVID and climate change is we've used the wrong communicators. So we keep going back to premiers and scientists. So the climate change discussion got stuck in a fight on science and scientists had to carry the day. We didn't have social scientists. We didn't have local community leaders or women at the very forefront of explaining and taking people on a journey of what, what climate means. And we lost, a, I reckon, 20 years of good work on climate response because it was all stuck in the ideology of science. Same with COVID. I think it's amazing. Most people don't watch the press conferences anymore because they just can't deal with the way the communication is one way in English and, and beating us up and telling us it'll all be okay if we just all play by the rules. Imagine if, if what had happened with the health messages on COVID, something like what has been done by Megan Davis and Pat Anderson with the Uluru Statement had been done. The Uluru Statement, they had translated into 60 languages by the SBS, so that every community in the country could read the Uluru Statement in their language and have a local conversation. So, so you know, the communication of the health messages should be in the hands of great communicators and storytellers and be translated through the people who understand their communities and actually do that with a deal of hope but clarity around what's got to happen. So that's the communication bit. Then the economy of care. If we actually just said, what are the greatest advantages this country has? It's we've got some of the best health systems, education systems, um, community leadership, and care is what is going to define the 21st century. If you don't have a, a, an economy that can manage mental health and, and support and everything with you, you, your experts in, but then the crisis of aged care, disability care and disability services, early childhood education and care, care for country, the move to renewable systems. Care could be the driver that says Australia comes out of COVID with a different view of what a vibrant economy is and had to actually put aside the resources economy for the care economy, having taken advantage of all those natural mineral resources, now it's about natural human resources. And with this incredibly vibrant community, Let's talk about a community. And so we could do that coming out of COVID and it would prepare us for the care that's gonna be needed to deal with other structural issues. So, so that would then mean that mental health was an integral part of wellbeing and physical health and community health, Ian. And we would be skilling people up in the industries of care. We wouldn't have to have raw commissions into why we treat our elderly so appallingly, or why disability workers don't have a career. We would be treating women with respect and be giving them career paths instead of, um, unequal work and unequal representation in leadership. So that's my big ambitious um, goal. And it can be done because we're a really bright, smart company with all of the levers and the incredible diversity across our communities, which Maha teaches us about and Georgie teaches it. And you, so that's my big, let's, let's have a really big, big moonshot on care that picks up all those other Cs. Can I pick up some of the specifics? Because in the modelling we've been doing about mental health impacts of the pandemic, the effect on women and young women in particular is most notable in our work. And I think, and to give governments credit, aspects of job keeper and job seeker and some other things were very important last year. And in my view, probably saved lives last year. Right. Although a lot of the support went into industries that supported particularly men between ages 25 and 60 in the way that they work and in their particular industries and support. Issues related to other industries, uh, casual work, other sets are not so evident. Now, I think in this particular phase, the pressure on women who have childcare responsibilities, home care responsibilities, home education, and are often typically in employment in our large cities. You know, if you live in our cities, most parents are at work one way or another and are aligned on grandparents and very grateful to be part of transgenerational communities like Mahas, where people actually participate much more actively in that. But the pressure on women in particular, and I think looking at, while well, we talk about the unemployment rates being low, the number of people, and particularly women, now not looking for work as they have the pressures of home care, childcare, homeschooling as well. And in terms of the mental health impacts of that, 
In terms of more urgent responses, Sam, that seems to me to be one that really needs to be the top of the agenda that is barely discussed. It, it absolutely is. I mean, I think um, Maha will have views on this too. Women have been, you know, if we talk, we talk about communities where you belong, at the moment in Australia, it's hard for a lot of women to feel like they really belong in the planning for the future because whenever we raise an issue about how our budget under responsive and haven't actually gone hard on childcare and early education and supports for women to be in work, paid work, be respected in work. The career path for women, the pathways to women in leadership we know has stalled. We know that during COVID of the 25 chief executives that were appointed, only one was a woman. And the reason given for why we went back to appointing men was it was too risky to appoint women during COVID. I mean, these are these are terrible cultural norms we've allowed to keep running. Um, and we've been, we're ignoring one of our greatest assets and in a time of closed borders and no immigration and very low population growth, women and the issues that actually fall on the shoulders of women are one of the smartest economic solutions. They should, as we go into the next budget, and we saw a little bit of movement on childcare in the last federal budget, but the community, the, the way in which politicians and policymakers think about that lens through which we can actually invest heavily in what I call the scaffolding of the real community and society, as opposed to just heavy, hard infrastructure of buildings and roads, we, this is a time to invest and as you said big decisions were made to spend big money at the right moment and I credit the federal government with that absolutely but don't stop the investment in the scaffolding for our communities through the things that really matter to the full engagement and respect for women from every community is the key to us being a successful economy that can face into all the new all of those complex challenges that lie ahead we've got to you've got to have a sense that the political rhetoric is changing and goes from hard hats and, and apprentices to the, the work that is done at a community level for care and that drives an economy. But I think Maha will have views about that because I mean, you're carrying that load with the women that you represent, Maha. Yeah, uh, look, I, I think you're, you're very right about what you've, and it is, a, it, but at the moment um, we don't have a choice, right? Um, so women are having to make um, you know, decisions um, not out of um, choice, but out of necessity. Um, because families um, are very important, and and the sense of, of you know when you you you, you know for women of um, of color as well as and women of non English speaking background, there's different layers that we have to um, you know and hurdles we have to jump over already. But in a sense of in a space where we're all locked down, there's so much that you um, will you will sort of um, unintentionally. Um, make decisions to not go there because it's too challenging and, and no one's listening. Um, so, you know, with, with the issue of even homeschooling at home, that is a, where is the support? Like, you know, um, women who can't speak English um, at home, having to support their young people. I mean, you know, I heard the other day of a year 12 student who normally does the tutoring, doesn't want to do tutoring online anymore because she's um, she said to her mum, I am tired, I've got fatigue of, of, of screen fatigue, she called it. The mother didn't understand what was going on. So, and, 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 and where are the choices in that way, in there, and the support that we need for these, um, for these women to, to, to really support their young women to, um, to, to, to really excel at what they do. So the fear and the, the, not, the, not just the anxiety and I think the platform and the platform is not there anymore for, for many of us um, in the support um, that is needed. It's not just about uh, creating a, um, a space where women can um, you know, uh, decide whether it's hard or, or soft. I think right now, as you mentioned, Sam, about the caring, and the care needs to be really, really um, um, harnessed in a way that it is about um, move away from um, from a community where we always talk about individualistic things. You know, about the individual. It's what matters for me. Um, and here, we, I, I'm just thinking about the bystander approach in the community where they've become policing. You know, I'm, I know. Um, I'm just moving away from the from from the other issue, but this just came to my mind is um, the neighbours have become policing of, of, of women and children, especially single women and children who were living at home. So there's all these, the bystander approaches coming up here in that space where neighbours are dobbing on each other um, instead of supporting one another. So that division- That is one of the most, 
I got to say, this one is most remarkable. Talk about things that have been called un Australian in recent times, the sort of term that's been wheeled out and fingered around. Now, dobbing your neighbor as a kind of approach to policing, as a public health order. Some really unusual things have happened. I think they've raised cultural ones. I wanted to raise another one, which, of course, this is all based on fear about what might happen and how the virus might spread. We saw early in the pandemic a lot of uh, attacks and abuse of Asian Australians, that they were somehow responsible for the virus coming. And I'm sensitive about this, having a Chinese Australian son-in-law and Chinese Australian grandson. You know, suddenly they're the cause of things, they're the threat. We're now seeing, I think, a large anti-immigration kind of idea, as if Australia hasn't thrived on immigration. You know, people on boats, putting out with the English, the first people to come on boats, you know, a kind of an idea about the others. And for those of us who work in the university sector where overseas students have made a tremendous contribution, not just financially to the vibrant nature of our cities, but actually to their cultural and emotional life. That Australia needs the cultural skills, the specific skills, and will rely increasingly, of course, on immigration. And most of us have relatives overseas or families we're missing and joining. But now we've become fearful again of the other including any sort of sense of the other within our own communities. So I just wonder what you each think collectively about this, because I think there are other potential legacies out of this, things we've tried to deal with, and sort of to put aside how much our cities in particular have thrived on immigration and cultural communities and inclusiveness and connection with the world towards this sort of small world, and now, dare I say, in each of our states and territories, you know, locked off communities, sort of islands, which in fact reinforce a lack of diversity and lack of inclusion. Sam, do you have a view? Well, I was hoping to listen to, to Georgia Maha, to be honest, because I, <laughs> um, I'll just be very brief. Are I you, say this because Georgia, I say it's good, Sam. You have previously had you know diversity in Australia and you know. Yeah, no, I, th I think you're absolutely right. Because, uh, what, what really upsets me about where we've got and why I still think we've got an opportunity is the actual fabric of the country is exactly as you've described and as we hear from Maha and Georgie and, and our, our experience. But we've allowed the tropes of division and those messages that have come from a particular style of leadership and a fight that has emerged between states and territories and the Commonwealth that is dividing us. So I guess what I go to is it is our great strength. We've got to retain that and do everything we can to, to honour and cherish it and do the hard work of, of what it means to really be curious about one another and care about one another and as Maha says, approach that with kindness and heart and not think that that's somehow avoiding the bigger structural things as it takes you to the structural change. Um, and so I think, it, it, and I think what we saw over the weekend, I just end up, you know, my sense is Australians really cared about what was happening in Afghanistan. Australians really thought we had a big job to do to get as many people clear of, of the Taliban and to play our role in a humanitarian international sense. And you could feel that, well, that wellspring going and politically you had a number of very senior people like um, um, the, the foreign minister and the immigration minister listening to good-hearted people like Craig Foster and Kurt Fernley and Zali Stegall and they managed to do something remarkable and get those visas for those Paralympians and those women athletes because it was the right thing to do and they moved quickly to do something unimaginable and that was about a connection between community and, and in this case sports leaders seeing that need and putting that pressure on government to act and they did. What a remarkable thing to reflect on to say we can do this. So I'd say the messages are we've got to actually invest heavily back in the trust we have. The, the community knows what's what's good, and politicians have to listen. So I think I'll stop there. And <laughs> well, I love comment. I mean, because I always think Melbourne, it's, it's probably of all of our cities, thrives on its cultural traditions of immigration and extent to which the culture we are all better off as a consequence of the whole diversity of the immigrant experiences and continues to do this. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I love Melbourne and I love how diverse it is. But, but one of the things that's really shocked me is how, how shallow beneath the surface racism and discrimination is still. Um, but I, but I, just taking it up to the bigger level, I mean, I think, you know, before COVID, we were seeing um, a world that was characterised by growing individualism and nationalism. And I think um, t COVID has turbocharged that. Um, uh, but but it, it's a very seductive proposition to kind of close your borders and to kind of turn inwards and think about what's best for you. And um, But ultimately, that's a fool's errand, because if this crisis has taught us anything, it's that we're only as strong as our weakest link. And um, whether it's action on climate change, whether it's managing the pandemic or ensuring access of quality 
uh, to, to food, water, education, health, whatever it is. Um, you know, we are part of a global community. There, there, there's, there's, and and so much of our economy is, is predicated on us being part of an uh, of a global community, as you pointed out, Ian. Um, so, and, and I think, do, so do we continue to become more insular after the threat of the pandemic has passed, or do we start to turn our gaze outwards again? I mean, I, I think it's the latter. We have to. Um, none of us is safe from this pandemic until all of us are safe, um, and. And you know, I think I think this this Fortress Australia um, uh, narrative is is really worrying, actually. I think one of the important issues I must say, to the credit of the Berejiklian government here in New South Wales, they have been strong on the return to overseas students to mm. other sets of views, not just yeah. well, whether it's for economic reasons or not, we can argue, but at least to say nationally, these are important, not just industries. This is our place in the world. This is our global connection in the world that we should be both partner to, providing education to, but also benefiting from our connections, particularly in our own region. Maha, I wonder if you'd like to comment, particularly, you know, how does it feel in immigration, in my, recently, you know, those newer communities, really strongly influenced by migration from non-English speaking backgrounds, to suddenly have these issues about cutting off a kind of white Australia from the world again, being sort of emphasized. Yeah, look, I agree with, you know, with it, what's already been said, and I just want to go back to the international students and the support of international students. Last year, we didn't have as much um, to be able to support them as much as what we have now. But I think it's the social isolation is what's happening now. The division is what's happening now. And I think, you know, it, uh, and I, it's not one size fits all, but I think we need to really focus and re, re, rethink about realigning with our purpose as a country, as humankind as well, as a global, uh, a global community, because, um, you know, we have access to, you know, anything and everything around the globe at the touch of a, of, of a button, literally. So we've just got to be more mindful of how we as a, you know, the lucky country that I say, the lucky country that I, my father chose to be my country and to live in, and I'm proud to be from a Lebanese heritage. And, and to be able to live that and, and leave and allow my children, my grandchildren to have that as well and to pass that on. But it's not up to an individual or a community to do that. It has to be seriously about changing the language. And the language does matter um, in a way where it creates that inclusive way of, uh, of, of, of caring for each other and for one another uh, and not dividing and not using faith or religion as a tool to divide us. I think whether we, we are people of faith or no faith, we, are, we all belong to a, a, a humankind. So um, what we have in common is that kind in the human. So we've got to really focus on the kindness. We've got to focus on, uh, on, uh, on the effect that our hearts can connect, you know, and words can make us or break us. And I remember, you know, that term, what we used to, when we were little, you know, words, stick and stones don't hurt us, whatever that, you know, I grew up in that, in the playground we used to say that but now it makes sense more than before because it is hurting it is hurting our health our physical health our, our well-being mentally so i think really the, the the aspect of caring in a most sincere intentional way is is a driver to to realign ourselves with the purpose of humankind in a collective just and that's probably a great place to almost wind up there's several questions and that's that suggest that uh, georgie maha and sam should stand for parliament immediately and i can keep my job in the higher education sector also that the voices of women are so important in this particular kind of conversation and uh, has been put out a number of times and just raised here again for those who've seen jacinda Ardern in new zealand talk about firstly actually before covid that mental health and well-being was on the national productivity agenda that the bottom line for new zealand isn't what serves the economy, but the economy serves the well-being of the people. And then when she was having her lockdown, she was in her jammies with her child and said, we are all off to bed, actually. And in many ways, it's not, and is dealing with the uncertainty and hard issues. So the ongoing communication, I think the words, as Maha was just saying, sticks and stones do break bones, you know, may not break your bones, but words, the words and the communication really matters. I personally feel we still have a lot of opportunity in Australia to influence the way that this conversation has. Specifically from a Sydney point of view, I must say, Sydney, I've always thought, I've loved as, as Georgie knows, lived in Melbourne, but I love the fact that Sydney has always been a genuinely global city. It sees itself as part of the world. 
And then within that, it needs to reflect that on an ongoing basis within its own world. We're a city of many communities. We're a city of many different backgrounds. And that is one of its great strengths. At the moment, the capacity to act together is being challenged. Yeah. It's certainly my hope that out of the particular crisis, we do address some of the structural changes that Sam so elegantly raised in the caring economy, which is a productive economy and an inclusive one. I certainly hope, as Georgie pointed out, that some of the structural problems that we had in mental health, in aged care, in disability care before this crisis, which have been revealed, will be seriously addressed. And I'm particularly grateful to Maha for her perspectives that come direct from those people who live with these experiences, that that needs to be amplified back to those who are actually trying to make the tough decisions. And to quote Jackie Troy, one needs to work with the mob. That is, the decision-making needs to be collective for all of us, not anarchy, not, not actually disorder, but order that arises through genuine collective action, through genuine concern that we are all acting genuinely in each other's interests within very complex times. There will be more challenges ahead. We all know that we're not out of this yet. There are many, many more challenges to come. So hopefully today's discussion has contributed to that. And I thank everyone who's participated in the discussion. I thank the Committee for Sydney for organising that, but particularly thank our very busy guests, Sam, Georgie and Maha for their time this morning. And I thank you for attending.